This is Greta Talk. It's different from On the Record at 7 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. This is a podcast, and we get to talk to people at greater length. And I am so excited because I have on the line to talk to us today Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Robert Bob Balcher. Lieutenant Colonel, nice to have you join us. You can call me Bob. I know I can call you Bob, and I suspected you were going to say that. But with all that you did, and I'm so much in awe of you and every single man and woman who fought in World War II and part of that effort, that it's hard for me not to want to call you Lieutenant Colonel. Well, the thing is, we had to do it. (laughs) And we, we were ordered to do it, and we did it. You sure did do it. So tell me, where did you grow up? I grew up in... uh, in nowhere, Texas, down in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Ninety-six years ago, that was nowhere. Uh, I grew up on a ranch about nine miles from town. We had no, it was very peaceful. We had no radio, no television, no telephone, no mail delivery. Uh, We uh, had a lot of uh, cattle and horses and coyotes. And it was a nine-hour trip to town to uh, shop, which was about once every two weeks. And uh, that was at a wagon. And I would estimate that we saw seven, eight, maybe nine wagons to one car in the nine miles. And uh, it was a a day outing to go shopping. Indeed. So how did you happen to join the military? And, And how old were you at the time? I was... 20 years old when I joined. How I happened to, I I was nine years old when Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic and he became uh, uh, my hero. And as you probably know, at that time there wasn't any six o'clock news. It was, he was uh, news for a whole year after he flew over. There was, he flew around the country and they'd quote him from Chicago today and St. Louis tomorrow and Denver the next day, and so every day he was in a paper for about a year. And then my sister started going with a crop duster, which was kind of a wild business in those days. That was in the 20s. And he had some rather fascinating stories about flying uh, and bailing wire held together airplanes. And then General Arnold started the Flying Club of America when I was a sophomore in high school, and I joined it and built a model airplane. And the next year, he wrote a book called This Flying Game, and it became my Bible. And uh, then General Marshall, who was another visionary, as Arnold was a great visionary, decided that there was something big going to happen in the near future. This is about 1935. And he started a CMTC, Citizens Military Training Camp, and you went off to camp uh, for one month in the summer. You were attached to a military unit, which in my case was it, uh, outside of San Antonio in a godforsaken uh, reservation attached to a unit at Fort Sam Houston. And we had mock warfare, and one of the rules was that if an airplane flew over you and circled you, you had to take cover and stay covered as long as that airplane was still there. This was the first year that airplanes, imagine that, were used in maneuvers. Uh, It started about uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, and 2 o'clock we were still covered by airplanes, and I said to myself, those guys are going back to San Antonio, shower, go to dinner, and take their girl out to the movies tonight, and here I am stuck in (laughs) poison ivy up to my... You know what? And um, I missed my lunch and probably going to get K rations for dinner. I'm going to get in the Air Force. But you had to have a college degree, so off to college I went. And uh, Arnold, another visionary move, he started flying lessons and he gave you two credits, college credits, and you got a pilot's license, which the Air Force said, hey, come on in, we'll give you some real training. And I did so and and, uh, went through training and graduated in April of 1941, six or eight months before Pearl Harbor. <laughs> I'll stop right there. What do you uh, want me? All right. So, uh, so uh, that was about six or eight months before Pearl Harbor. Um, where were you when Pearl Harbor got hit on December 7th, 1941? I was assigned out of flying school to the second bomb wing in Langley Field, Virginia, which was the key 
strategic bomb wing, all the big wigs that uh, were proposing the possibilities of what airplanes could do on a strategic basis, General LeMay, General Holes, General Spots, and General Andrews, and actually General Arnold used to come down to Langley Field and get his flying time in. It was a B-17, one of the early first B-17 wings, heavy bombardment wings. Uh, I was a raw second lieutenant pilot in training. I had about six months to a year to go before I would ever land the B-17. One minute after Pearl Harbor, I became a full-fledged combat pilot, one of General Arnold's 1,100 full-fledged combat pilots. And from that day on, it was a five-year odyssey, just under under four years, just under four years. Uh, I went all over the world and flew all kinds of airplane bombers and came out the other end <laughs> and ended up leading the last mission of World War II. Which was which mission? That was the mission over the battleship Missouri uh, at the signing of the surrender by the Japanese in the Tokyo Bay. And General MacArthur, who headed up that, uh, was in charge of it, was a traditional Army man. And the tradition in the Army had always been for centuries before that the defeated Army was uh, disarmed and put at parade rest, and the winning army would parade in front of them with all their gear and armament, and it was to convince the surrendered party that they did the right thing. So MacArthur said, how are we going to do a show of force? That was called a show of force. How are we going to do a show of force in Tokyo Bay? And uh, General LeMay said, I'll put every serviceable B-29 in the air and over, over it at the time of the signing. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time and ended up being the leader. And my target time was 9.17, which was the scripted time that MacArthur would put the final signature on after all of those had signed. I had to put together 525 B-29s from Tinian, from Saipan, and from Guam and some Navy ships from aircraft carriers that were in, in the area and get over the target time. The last message I had from General Ramey uh, was, Vosche, you better not miss this target time. And we hit it right on the head, 917. I have a beautiful picture taken by a Chicago Tribune reporter that was on board my plane taken at 917, looking down on the battleship. It's a beautiful picture, and it hangs in the uh, Nimitz Museum in Texas. I'm going to have to see that next time I'm down there. What's sort of also interesting is that... Oh, as that's a good museum. You shouldn't miss it. Oh, I know. I've heard it is. Is uh, on the Missouri, this is another little piece of history, is that John McCain, Senator John McCain's grandfather was also on that Missouri at the time, at the time of the signing. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Let me ask you about the B-29. Um, that is a huge plane. I was just recently, uh, there was an air show, and so on a Saturday, so I drove out to go look at the air show, and they're letting tourists oh, get on the did. plane. That's an, that's a, an amazing uh, an amazing plane, that B-29. Well, there again, I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and I was assigned to pick up the first B-29 the Air Force accepted under their contract from Boeing Aircraft. It was built in Wichita, Kansas. A captain and myself went from Hayes, Kansas. Uh, we were flown over to Wichita, and they had a ceremony, and they broke a bottle of uh, something or other on the nose wheel, and, and off we were to go to take the airplane to Hayes, uh, which was where they were forming the first B-29 unit. And I was a first lieutenant and the other fellow was a captain so he should be first pilot however he said you're going to fly this airplane as first pilot because you have two hours and 15 minutes of time in it and i only have an hour and 45 minutes of time so we flew off to hayes kansas and i ended up uh, delivering the first airplane they accepted and that started a two-year odyssey that took me from 
Hayes, Kansas, to Walker, Kansas, to Paradova, India, to Chengdu, China, and Tinian Island, and finally back home after uh, a couple of years. And I ended up with a total of 117 combat missions, but not in B-29s. I had I had 29 missions in a B-29 bombing missions, bombing for photographic and reconnaissance. And they declared the flight over the battleship Missouri as a combat mission, so I ended up with 30 combat missions in a B-29, not 29. Were you ever afraid? Was I ever what? Afraid. I mean, for, I mean, so many men, I mean, when I went to this air show, they told me that 52% of the British airmen never made it. You know, that, uh, I mean, the casualties yeah, were yeah, so yeah. high. That was terrible. No, you know, that's funny you asked me that question. I was interviewed by Tokyo Television down there the other day at the ceremony. And one of the questions he asked me was, were you ever afraid when you were bombing our country? <laughs> And my answer is, I was never afraid. I was concerned at time, but an airplane commander couldn't be afraid. He just couldn't be a commander if you were afraid. You, you had a huge airplane, and 10 other crew members all had a job of their own, and you, you had to be concerned that everybody was doing their job, and, you know, from the bombardier to the navigator to the radio operator to the radar operator. So you just didn't have time to be afraid if you... Or had a propensity of it. However, I never remember being afraid on any mission. I was concerned on many a mission because you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. I once had a conversation with President Bush 41, who likewise um, was in World War II, and he told me that when he was shot down in, I don't know what year it was, 44, 45, he said to me, if I had told him at the time that some time in the future that we would be allies with Japan, he would have said I was crazy. And of course, now, of course, Japan is our ally. Do you have that same sort of sense that, uh, going back to that time, that the thought that we could ever be friends with Japan? No, I, I, I was asked that by a Tokyo television, how I felt about what happened. And I said, well, it was the greatest thing that ever happened in the world. Japan went from an autocracy to a democracy and mainly as a result of our doings as, as occupants of Japan. And MacArthur should be given full credit for making it happen. And I, I told him, I said, I, you, you are now friends of ours, not enemies of ours, and in, in, you're of the same mindset as we are with a democracy. And MacArthur completely changed that country. Do you, as far as I'm concerned, that's my opinion. I, I remember when I was a little girl, my mother used to be, she, when she'd bring up MacArthur, she was always so upset that MacArthur got fired. What, what's your thought about uh, when he got fired? Well, I think you have to take into consideration MacArthur's ego. I think he had a, a very, very big ego, and he had hoped to go on beyond being commander and of the occupation forces he had hoped that he would be, and, and commanding the Korean operation, he had hoped to be president. And he seemed to have gotten a little irrational when it became apparent he wasn't going to make it. And I mean by irrational, he, he seemed to have lost his trend of how to get to where he wanted to be, what should be done and what should be said. I, I think that uh, Truman did the right thing because MacArthur, I think, had it gotten too big for his pants, if you will, pardon the expression. <laughs> why, why do you think so many men and women came back from World War II? And it, it was, like, amazing. They just they just picked up and went back to their older lives, and, you know, and they didn't talk much about the war for so many decades, it seemed. That's a common refrain. You hear that all the time from, from uh, children and grandchildren. It, my uncle or my grandfather never said anything. Well, I, I think it was something that, and I can say that outside of my family and outside of what I do now, I give talks about World War II. Matter of fact, i got to speak to a high school group uh, next couple weeks from now. Uh, and I'm also going to speak at the Reading Air Show for three days. I don't think I discussed uh, World War II very much with my children until they got grown up and were coming back home for Thanksgiving, and they would ask key questions just like you were doing, and, and you'd get into it. But 
Well, let, let, let me just digress. I can remember in the height of the war living in a tent in China. At night, all we had was a lantern for light, and we'd sit around on our cots and discuss things. And one of the things that we spent a lot of time discussing was what are we going to do when we get back home? And we all assumed we were all going to get back home. And the general trend, and it was my position also, was when we get back home, we're going to straighten things out and, and get the local governments functioning the way they ought to function. <laughs> we didn't really know how they were functioning, but we didn't think they were functioning right. And I came back, and believe it or not, after all my war experience and getting to be a lieutenant colonel at a young age, practically as a kid, I came back, and the first thing I did was join the volunteer fire company in my town right here and went to fire school and learned to climb ladders and things like that. And you got to think of it in terms not of my 96 years, but of my 26 years at that time or 25. We, we just wanted to get on with things. And, and I, I remember very deep discussions on how we were going to straighten out the country. <laughs> well, we all have those discussions. They're still going on, sir. And uh, I just want to tell the listeners that uh, we've been talking to Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Robert Bob Fauché, who is 96 years old, World War II, flew B-17s, B-29s, and uh, so many missions. And, sir, I must thank you because, uh, you know, it's like you and everybody else in World War II changed the world for the good for the rest of us. And I deeply appreciate uh, all that you did. Well, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to meet you. <laughs> well, I hope we meet again, maybe at the next air, because I chase these air shows a little bit because, I mean, the, all of it, and I urge all the listeners, and, you know, just to go online and see when they have these B-29s or B-17s around. Uh, by the way, you'll like this, sir. I got in the belly turret of a B-17. I'm only five foot three. I don't know how, how anyone taller than I am can get into those things. Oh, that was, that, that was terrible duty. I flew about 17. I flew 24s. As a matter of fact, I flew almost half of the airplanes that flew over the mall the other day at, uh, in one form or another, not in combat. Uh, some of them just purely recreational. And uh, can I say one more thing? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I hope that the flyover and the ceremony that took place the other day is just a wake-up call. Other ceremonies like it. And I think I think every state in the nation on the Fourth of July should have have some kind of a, way, a ceremony that's more than just a, a parade down Main Street, but a state affair, if not a national affair. So uh, I hope that it is a wake up call, and some more of these will happen. I do too, and I should tell you that when I was out there, um, I learned that the lead plane it was a B-17 on D-Day has been located in Wisconsin and this organization is restoring it to be part of this program. But it was the lead B-17 on D-Day uh, that's being restored. So that's really fun. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that. Still around. Ah. Still around. The first one, yep, the lead one. Isn't that exciting? And there are four crew members that are still around to talk about it. So um, that's also exciting too. I'm, I'm thinking of trying to get everybody together, the plane and the four crew. <laughs> No kidding, four crew members. Now, yeah. my crew of 11, I'm the only one alive. So. Well, you, you represent them well, and I thank you very much for joining us, sir. Well, thank you for having me, and I look forward to meeting you again. And, indeed. And as a note to our listeners, we're always adding to the Greta Talk collection. You can get the latest ones or catch up on Greta Talk sessions you've missed at gretawire.com slash podcast and gretatalk.com. We're also available on iTunes, TuneIn, and Stitcher. And, of course, watch On the Record on the Fox News Channel, 7 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. And, again, a many thanks to all those uh, who served in World War II. They did so much for the world. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.